Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, the rest of y'all. Good to see you in Sunday school today. It's time to get rolling. Glad to be in church. Looks like the great falling away has started to our column left right over here already in April the 21st. Looks like it's already started, but we do have Brother Chris over here holding the anchor and the side down. Maybe he'll have some more come in as we go. Good to see you all in Sunday school today. I'm excited about what's happening at Gospel Tabernacle. I'm excited about what we're uh, going to see today and throughout the next few days. It's just uh, we're into some months that are just loaded down with activities, and I don't want to get too active that we don't have room for God. Do you? Uh, I think I talking to someone just the other day, last week actually, and uh, he was telling me about their church and uh, different things about it that he was happy with and some that he wasn't so happy with. And he said, we've got a lot going, but we don't have anything going. I said, you know what we've done? I said, we have programmed the Lord basically out of the church. I said, we have got our program so programmed that we can't get off schedule and we don't give the Lord anywhere to move anymore. Uh, I don't want to get that way to you. I want to let the Lord have his way this morning. If I teach or if I don't teach or if a preacher preaches or he don't preach, I want the Lord to have his way in our service. Uh, we've got to we've got to have the spirit of the Lord, folks. If we don't have that in our service, we're just another little social club. That's all we are. So uh, I'm looking for the spirit of the Lord to move today. Let's go ahead and stand today and talk about some of our requests that we have. Keep remembering Sister Wilbanks in her prayers. Uh, Sister Catherine Bean, she's recovering, so uh, let's remember her. Kim Talley's sick, let's remember her this morning. Brother Ricky Butler, uh, the Dye family, let's remember all these requests. Brother and Sister Cutshaw, uh, continue to keep them on our prayer list. There was an accident last week, and I don't know the people's name that was involved in it, but I do know that uh, down on, I believe it was on Highway 9, uh, log truck had jackknifed and uh, ran into a lady they collided head on. I think she was 32 years old, if I remember correct, 32 years old with a family, and uh, they will be going through a lot this uh, next, well, for the next weeks and months and even years. And uh, let's pray for them. As I said, I don't know the name uh, to give you this morning, but just the situation. So let's pray for that situation that the Lord will handle that. Anyone else got a prayer request you'd like to give today? Anyone else? Brother Chad? Yes. Oh, wow. Let's give the Lord a great big hand for that. Thank the Lord for answering prayers. Uh, our prayers are not in vain, folks, but... Uh, I believe the Lord hears every one of our prayers. So let's uh, let's pray for these requests this morning that the Lord will move on these. Pray for our service throughout the day. Brother Rogers, lead us to the Lord in prayer this morning. Amen. You can be seated. Our ushers, come on and grab our Sunday school offering this morning. I've got uh, I've got our lesson today, and I hopefully it's something you'll enjoy. Can't tell you nothing new. Most of you are a lot smarter out there than I am. Well, probably most of you out there, maybe all of you out there are smarter than I am. I don't know, but... Uh, I just want to give us something to kind of think about, study on. Uh, as I said, I can't bring you anything new. A lot of you have studied the Word of God, and you know it from front to back. And uh, people out there like Brother Rogers that can quote more than I probably have ever uh, could ever to quote. And uh, so I, anyway, maybe I can stir us up a little bit this morning, just talk about some things uh, that's been on my heart lately. I don't know if you've been listening to the news this last week, 
but uh, we can see the Bible being fulfilled every day. Uh, if you can, you can see, uh, if you've listened to the news or turned on the news, Israel is in the fight for survival right now, and it looks like that just as the Bible said, that every nation will turn against Israel. Even our own United States, we have protests going on in our own United States against our greatest ally, Israel, against God's people, Israel. Uh, the protests are going on, probably probably some going on today. And uh, I was hoping, I, you know, I've read the Bible through, and I was, uh, I know what the Bible says about every nation will be turned against Israel. And uh, I, I don't know, for some reason, I was hoping the United States wouldn't be one of them every nations, but it looks like it looks like we're going to be one of them, uh, as bad as I hate to see it. But, you know, the Bible's going to be fulfilled. It's just going to, you know, it's, you can take it to the bank. If you find it in the Bible, it's going to be fulfilled. And the Lord is coming back to, to visit us again one day. He's coming whether we're ready or not. And we've, we've talked about the coming of the Lord for so many years, and a lot of us have been in church all of our life, and uh, somehow it nearly becomes mundane to us, but uh, it's coming. The Lord is coming, and uh, it'll be for those that made themselves ready that will get to go back and live with Him. But I was listening to the news last week, and uh, it's, it's amazing how our own nation has turned against God and against godly principles even into a mockery of God. And who would ever thought we'd be in the middle of election year, which we're getting close to election time, and one of the key issues on the, on the ballot is abortion. That, that shouldn't even be on the ballot. That's already condemned. That's not a voting issue. Uh, you know, I, I, I heard them last week talking about, well, the, you know, uh, the mother's got a right to choose and the women's body and all this kind of stuff. I said, she did choose. She chose nine months earlier. She, she already made that choice. And uh, she's just got to take responsibility for the choices she made. Uh, she don't get a choice with, with another human's life. What, what kind of, what kind of uh, logic is that? That you get a choice on whether another person lives or not. See, that don't even make good sense. But that's what we're right in the middle of uh, is the world calling wrong right. Uh, that's the way of life now for the world. Uh, you know, I can't believe that we're in a spot where when a person is born, they want to try, try to change the sex that they're born of. Uh, from a boy to a girl or a girl to a boy. I don't... Uh, not only do I... Don't think that's right. I believe that's a sin against God. I believe that's an abomination against God. Uh, when, Jock, when God chooses to make you a woman or, or a man or a boy or a girl when you're born, that'd be a sin against God if you tried to change that. We're getting some good amens, and I appreciate this morning. But, I, you know, it's not intended for you to choose whether your baby is a boy or girl. That's God's choice. That is God's choice. That's 100%. And the Christians have stayed silent for way too long. And we need to call it like just like it is. Call it just like it is and don't back up. Uh, I know that we have a society that's uh, all involved in that, but uh, let me just address something else. That's our gay society that we're in. There's no pride about that lifestyle. There's no pride about that lifestyle. That is a sin against God. The gay lifestyle is not right. God destroyed a whole city because of that. A whole city. Don't think the United States is going to slip past the judgments of God when we start condoning this. We're not we're 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 right in the bullseye, as a matter of fact. We're right in the bullseye of God's wrath. And let me just make it clear. I I I don't condone it, and I think it's a sin. I know it's a sin. From what the Bible says, it's it's a sin. Uh, there's no, and I, I don't even want to associate with it. I don't even want to be around it. I'm just telling you my feelings on this. Paul it says this in Romans 1 and 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness 
of man who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Do you see what that said? The wrath of God is revealed. Because that which because th that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Now see, this is people acting dumb. Because God's already showed them. That, people's not as dumb as they acting like they are during our day and time. They, they know the gay lifestyle is against God. God's already showed it to them. That's what the Bible said. This is the wrath of God being poured out. And they're acting like we're idiots. What is wrong with them people? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Do you see that? Being understood by the things that we that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they... So that they have, are without excuse. They don't have an excuse for it. They are without excuse. What's he specifically talking about? He's going to spell it out in this next verse. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. There's two reasons we've got the mess we've got going on right now in our world. And this spells it out right here. When they knew God, they didn't respect him as God. They didn't treat him as God. And they were not thankful. That's the two reasons. This is what it is that has caused where we're at. And they became vain in their imaginations. Am I describing the world or what? And their foolish heart was darkened. Here we go again. Professing themselves to be wise. See, I told you, they're idiots. They're crazy, and they're calling us crazy. They are professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. That's what the Bible calls them. They became fools. They're trying to make out like we're crazy. They've got their college degrees, and they're trying to act like we're just some kind of backwoods-type folks, but they're the crazy folks. I'm telling you, they're the crazy folks. They became fools. Verse 22 says, And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I had a guy send me a text message yesterday. He was in Lowe's in Batesville, Mississippi. And there was a guy in there with a, with a, I, I don't know what this is he's got on. Uh, it's the weirdest looking thing, and they, he called him a furry. And he's got, he had all kind of a little helmet gear on, looked like some kind of animal, and, and was walking on all fours. And he sent me a message. He said, Keith, this world is going to hell. I said, this is exactly where it's headed, brother. It is exactly where it's headed. Now, this is what the Bible is describing right here. L look at this next verse. Wherefore, which means because of this that I just read to you, God also gave them up. Do you see that? I, I'm not making this up. This is in your Bible. God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. That's what happens when God gives you up. I'm not making this up. I'm not calling judgment down on them. They're already judged. That's already condemned by God. It ain't going to get no better. Who changed the truth of God into a lie? Do you know where liars are going? All liars shall have their place in the lake of fire. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And here we go again. For this cause... God gave them up. Do you see that? Did I not already read to you one time where God gave them up? Here's where we are the second time. For this reason, for this reason, God gave them up unto vile affections. Do you know what that is? Shameful and disgraceful, lewd acts. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their own lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. I, 
I can't tell you in a mixed congregation what this word unseemly come from in the book of in the Hebrew language. You'll just have to go look for look that up for yourself. But it is terrible. It's a terrible thing what this word unseemly means. And it's saying men working that which is unseemly. You need to look that up on your own time when you're by yourself because I can't tell you everything. Here we go. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. Do you know that's the third time that I have read that in about five verses? God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them over. To reprobates, to a reprobate, Man, which means worthless and a castaway and rejected man, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, and disobedience to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgments of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. I hadn't made none of that up, folks. That all came right out of the, I, I, I fix to say right out of the Martin Luther King, but it came right out of the Holy Book of the Bible. The King James Version. Not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. Three different times, God gave them up. God turned them over. God gave them up. Why are the United States spending so much time trying to rescue something that God has already condemned? He's already gave those up. Now, you know, if God gives up on you, I don't know anything I can do for you. I mean, I'd like to help you all I can, but if God gives up and turns his back on you and turns you over to something else, so you see, he sent them a, a delusion, and they believe in something that ain't any real. And when God sends their own delusions to them, they ain't nothing you can do. When God turns his back and gives up on them and turns them over to a reprobate man, what, what, how are you going to appeal that to God? You say, well, he can forgive any sin. Sure he can. He's a sovereign God. He can, he can forgive anything he wants to forgive. How many do you see him forgiven? How many are you seeing come back? Hello? They want to keep their sin and keep their spot. Let me tell you, it won't work in the... In the your body is the temple of God. And, and that, that he has already condemned will not work in the temple of God. I, you can ordain him to be a preacher or a pastor or whatever you want to, but when God is done with you, he's done with you. It don't matter what I do or what I say. See, God is not obligated to me, and he's not obligated to you. We can't obligate God to anything because he's all powerful and he's all sovereign. But he obligated himself to his word. He said, this is my word. Heaven and earth may pass a word may pass away, but my word will never pass away. In other words, it is firmly established. It's not going anywhere. So if you're waiting for God to change his mind on some of these things I just read to you, forget it. It ain't going to happen. God's word is forever settled in heaven. That's what the Bible says. It's forever settled in heaven. And if we're not careful as Christians, when we start this trying to be all tolerant, I, and I, I try to be tolerant as I can. But when it comes to sin that God has spelled out in the word of God, sin is sin, and that's it. It's not ever going to be right. It's not ever, you can't make it right. It ain't ever going to be the right thing. When God says it's wrong, it's, if we're not careful, folks, we'll get in the same predicament that Balaam got himself in. As Balak came to him and wanted him to curse the people of God, and he said, oh, yeah, I can go down there and do that. Let me say a little prayer right quick. And he said a little prayer, and God said, you don't go down there. So he come, He was kind of surprised. He come back and said, I can't go. I can't go. So they left and come back and put a, brought a little more dignified people. And look, see, they brought the smart ones in. 
Those that's graduated from Harvard, they're smart. They're supposed to know what's happening. They brought them in and said, come on, go with us. I better, let me pray one more time. He prayed again. God said, don't you go. He got up and said, well, I can't go. Well, we got some smarter ones than this. Look, y'all, you living in the past. You living under the old covenant now. See, this is a new age. This is a new thing we've got going. So they brought the more dignified back and offered a little more money. And God finally said, go ahead and go. Go ahead. He got up and go, but he didn't feel too good about it. And when he got down there, Balak took him to the mountain, and they looked over and seen the children of God down there. He said, curse them. And he said, oh, I'm, hmm. He done told me twice not to go, but he gave me the okay to go. I better build an altar and sacrifice. Do you know what good that done? Not one bit of good. That's what I'm trying to tell you. If it's sin, it ain't going to get nothing but sin. That's all it's going to ever be. See, Balak built an altar, and he sacrificed. He done all the holy things. Oh, this is the religious thing to do. This is, the, this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is in the Word of God. But then when he stepped up to curse the Word of the people of God, it wasn't nothing but a blessing. And Balak said, ho, ho, I brought you down here to curse them. You're saying nothing but blessings. He said, look, what God has blessed, he's blessed. What he's cursed, he's cursed. I can't do nothing about it. Let me tell you, folks, if we're not careful as Christians, we'll get in the same place that Balak did, trying to be tolerant, and this sin will move right in on top of us. It will take over. It's not happy to sit on your pews. It wants to be in the pulpit. It's not happy riding in your back seat. It's going to want to drive. I'm just telling you, folks. Do you remember when uh, in the book of Genesis, and I know you do, God pronounced judgment on the serpent. Actually, this serpent was Satan. It was in the form of a serpent, but this was Satan himself. He was the most deceiving spirit in the garden. And God said that because you have done this, that you're cursed among the cattle, and I'll put enmity or hatred between you and the woman. That was Satan as the serpent. This was a disobedient spirit, a rebellious spirit. And if you remember, that was some of the things that were listed in Romans that I just read to you. That goes along with all this that we're dealing with right now. In Mark 16, Jesus is preparing uh, his ascension back to heaven. He goes to his disciples and says, go into the, all the world and preach the gospel. Those that believe will be saved. Those others that don't believe will be damned. And these signs will follow the believers they will cast out devils and speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. That's not talking about snakes. That's talking about these evil spirits. That's what this is talking about. The meaning is a sly, cunning, malicious person. And that is Satan as a serpent. And it references back to Genesis when God cursed the serpent. This verse does not imply picking up snakes. It does re refer casting out devils. He refers to Satan as a sly and a malicious type spirit. That's the same description that was in Romans 1 where I read to you, maliciousness is an attribute of a gay person. These are spirits that, that have taken over a person, and if we're not careful, we give place to the devil. And the Bible says don't give place to the devil. Don't give him no place. Don't give, see, if you give him a foot, he wants a yard. Yeah. He'll take a yard. Yeah. You give him an inch, and he'll, he'll want the whole football field for it's over with. Yeah. You better not let the devil ride. He want to be the driver. This is the Antichrist spirit, folks. This is the Antichrist spirit that we're fighting. Uh, and I know we're taught to be acceptive of all, and we try to be, you know, we open our doors to all, but we're going to have to call sin, sin. We can't pretend we can't pretend any longer. We're going to have to call sin, sin. Ephesians 4 and 29 says this. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor of evil speaking be put away from you with all Malice. 
He goes on to the next chapter and says fornication and uncleanness and covetousness. All of these are mentioned in Romans chapter 1. Let it not be once named among you as become saints. If you become a saint, you can't do that no more. And do not let men deceive you with vain words, for because these things cometh, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Be ye therefore... Be not ye therefore partakers with them. People of the light have no communication with those, those things of the dark. Is that a true? Well, that was the hardest part of that lesson. And most of you took it pretty good. I even got some amens out of it. If you don't believe what I've told you in these last few minutes... It's happening in our world today. I want you to turn to chapter 1 in Romans. I want you to read that chapter and immediately turn on the news. And you can just about go line for line and word for word. Everything that's happening right now. Well, I've got a lesson for us this morning. I've done went nearly, I've done went nearly 30 minutes on this. And I'm just now starting my lesson. That, my lesson don't have anything to do with what I just talked about. Not one thing. I'm sorry about that. I ain't sorry about that. That's just the word of God. And every once in a while, the devil gets me mad. And, and uh, I, t this morning is one of those times. Uh, when I've sat through a week and seen what I've seen on the national news of what our country has turned into and how they're trying to make the Christian people feel like that we're the ones that's in the wrong. If we're going to be a nation based on Christian, Christian principles, we're going to have to get rid of some of this garbage we have got up there. I'm not telling you how to vote because I, you know, I don't know if either one of the candidates are that good, just to tell you the truth. But I know what we got right now ain't working. And it's against the word of God, totally against the word of God. How can a man call him a Christian and vote for what we've got right now? I'm bold enough to say that, folks. I'm bold enough to say that. Everything that the word speaks against, therefore, that's, that's an automatic turn. That's an automatic no for me. Well, I'll get off of that now. We're fixing to get to our lessons. I've got to get off of this. Uh, I don't. How many has never rode or ridden on an airplane, rode an airplane, flew on an airplane? How many never have? Oh, wow. Y'all have never rode on an airplane? i got to get you on there, Chris. You've done everything, son. You need to be riding on an airplane. How many more? Somebody else hadn't? Oh, several of you. Sister Connie, you hadn't rode on an airplane? I didn't know that. Uh, well, this is one of the most phenomenal things, inventions, that man has ever invented. I don't know why it scares you so bad. Uh, you don't have to drive. I'll put that to rest right now. I don't need your help after you get on there. Matter of fact, all you got to do is just sit there. That's all. And get off when it, when it lands, and it won't be long. It'll be pretty quick. Uh, the, the pilot don't need your help. You don't have to tell him anything. Daddy Bill and... My granddaddy, Brother Frazier, we call him Daddy Bill, but uh, he had never flown. And uh, D. Cook, that married Teresa, Leon's daughter, was going to carry him up to, uh, I believe it was up to West Virginia, to a convention they had up there. He was wanting to drive, and D. told him, said, we can, Daddy Bill, we can get on an airplane and go up there. He said, we can be there in just a few minutes. If we drive, it's going to take us 10 or 12 hours, you know, to get there. And kept talking to him and talking to him. And finally, he, Daddy Bill agreed to go. And uh, he, he wasn't much on this modern, anything modern convenience. Never been on an airplane. So they got on there and got seated. And he sat all the way up there. His knuckles were white from hanging on to that. Every time that plane would move, he was jumping. And uh, he was scared to death when he got there. But he said, we, we got there and landed and got off. And he said his... Granddaddy's, my granddaddy's knees was about like jelly, him trying to walk across that airport after riding that airplane. He had been so scared on that thing. And so he, he said, I was dreading coming back. He said, I was dreading so bad coming back. 
because I know he was scared to death of it. But he said, we got on, got the convention done and got on the train, a plane and coming back. And uh, he said, we got on there. He said, I told him, he said, lay your head back and go to sleep. Turn the air on for him. He said, just lay your head back and go to sleep and rest through the airplane ride. You won't, you know, you won't know a lot about it. So they finally got off the ground. Sure enough, he laid back and rested, started sleeping, and was kind of snoring. And Dee said, I was so glad he was kind of out of it. But they got to where they was going to land. And the plane started coming down. And it hit those turbulence. And he jumped up out of his seat and said, Ho, ho, slow this thing down up there. <laughs> well, you can't slow this thing down up there. You've got to keep it going to get there to where you're going. But you that have never rode an airplane, this is one of the most phenomenal things that man has ever invented. Uh, jet airplanes are just amazing. I don't, my simple little mind cannot get my hands around how they can do that. Uh, I've flown a lot on commercial airlines. Uh, the Airbus 333 cruises at 532 miles an hour, can hold 393 passengers. There's an Airbus A300 series, 295 passengers. It's 209 foot long. 198-foot wingspan can reach up to 567 miles an hour. That's the one you need to be on, Connie. Then there's the Boeing 747. I've been on the Boeing 747. That is one bad dude right there. That is a bad airplane. Can accommodate, can accommodate nearly 400 passengers. Can fly at a speed of 614 miles an hour. That's a good cruising speed. Uh, they can go 7,200 miles between Phillips. That's a pretty amazing feat. These massive jets can weigh upwards of 350,000 pounds and fly 50,000 feet high. That's a, one amazing instrument. It's just it's phenomenal how they can get a piece of metal up there and get it to fly like they do. It's just it's just amazing. Never in my mind do I see how that's possible. It's one of the most amazing inventions that I've ever seen. Uh, and every time I get on there, I just I love to feel when we start taking off. I love to feel the rush when it just sucks your gut to your backbone. And I can feel that power. And man, this is some power on this dude. Uh, I love I love feeling that power. But uh, the first time I ever flew, I might have been like some, I'm not gonna get to my lesson today. I just already see that. <clears throat> The first time I flew on an airplane, I was flying to Atlanta. It's a short trip. It's less than an hour from Memphis to Atlanta. By the time you get up and get leveled out, you're just about landing. But it just so happened on my first flight, it was stormy. It wasn't in Memphis, but it was in Atlanta. It was stormy. And we got to Atlanta, and we started circling, circling, circling. We could see the airport down there below us, but... Uh, it was so stormy you couldn't land, and the pilot came on and said, uh, we're in a heavy traffic area. Uh, that's not a good feeling when you're getting heavy traffic on an airplane. I don't mind heavy traffic in the car, but I don't want to be in no heavy traffic when I'm flying on an airplane. And he said, we've got storms, and we're trying to stay above them, but we're going to have to land here in a few minutes. And about every time that pilot would come on and say something, I think it's fixing to level off. That thing would fall probably 500 to 1,000 feet and hit just like it's hitting concrete, just like that. Well, my gut was still up yonder somewhere. And here we are. We'd, we'd fall and we'd take back off and fly back and pop back down. Before we landed, I found out where the barf bag was. I figured it out real quick. First time I'd ever flew and I had to use it. Never had to use it anymore. But I did that one time, that first time. But flying is fun. It's a lot of fun. If I'm going somewhere and want to get there in a hurry, that's the way I want to go. Uh, they're relatively safe. Uh, there ain't no airplane body shops. You're just there for the duration, and if it goes down, it's just goodbye, Mama, hello, Jesus. That's just about the way it is. But it's a good way to move. But I've told you over and over uh, when I've talked to you before, that I 100% believe a Christian person, man, woman, boy, or girl, is, in, is intended to excel in their walk with God. I don't believe every day should be a bad day. 
I believe, actually, I believe you should have a lot more good days than you do bad days. You may have a bad day every once in a while, but I don't believe every day should be bad. I don't believe every day should be your saddest day on earth. I think most of your days should be happy days. We'll have a sad day occasionally, but Brother Don Johnson's song, song says that all the good days are out the way the bad days. The Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. That's the transgressor's route. And we should be happy. Uh, we should be living an abundant life. Maybe we need another trip to the altar. I don't know. But Romans tells us that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, meat and drink but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Every time the Bible mentions the Holy Ghost, if it has an attribute, it's always with peace and with joy. Look that up if you don't believe it. That's always the attribute of the Holy Ghost or living the Christian life. It's peace and joy. If, you're not, if you don't have peace and joy living for the Lord, we need, to, we need another dose of the ghost. That's what we need. Everywhere the Holy Ghost is mentioned, it's with peace and joy. Every day should not be a drag on you if you're a Christian. The Bible says, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to talk to you this morning on what time I've got left, which is very little, on created to fly. Created to fly. Created to fly. There's four things that cause a big jet airplane to be able to fly. The engine's important, but it is not one of the four. I was very surprised about that. You'd think you'd have to have an engine to fly, but you know gliders fly, and they don't even have an engine. That's true. But there's four things that will either cause a jet airplane to fly or to crash. The engine or motor is not one of them. But these four things are weight, thrust, drag, and lift. These four things cause an airplane to either fly or to crash. Weight, you say, well, I thought you said they weigh 350,000 pounds. Balanced weight. Balanced weight is very important if an airplane is going to fly. Balanced weight. See, the Bible says lay aside those weights that easily beset you. There's going to be a lot of weights that you ain't able to throw aside. There's the weight of life. Like you, you've got to make enough money during the month to pay your bills. That's kind of a weight, isn't it? But you can't lay it aside. When the bills come, you can't say, I'm just laying that aside. That's a weight on me. That, that high electric bill, that's, that thing's got to be a weight. And the Bible says lay all the weights aside. I'm just, I'll just throw that thing aside. Before long, you ain't going to have no electricity. So the Bible says lay aside those weights and sins that beset you, that easily beset you, and run the race. So balanced weight is very important. Even in a Christian's life, balanced weight is very important. Now let me read you Isaiah 40 and 31. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. That's a good verse right there. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Created to fly. Created to fly. <clears throat> We as Christians, when we were saved, we became overcomers by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. You know what our testimony is? Our testimony is that we're saved by grace. Not by works, but we're saved by grace. That's, our, that's the testimony of a Christian person. Grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, it saved a wretch like me, and by the blood of the Lamb. Those two things is what saves a Christian. That's what the Bible says. And then we're made more than conquerors. More than conquerors. So let me talk about weight real quick. Uh, a plane can fly at a steady pace, but it has to be properly balanced. There's something in aviation that's called vectors. I don't know if you've ever heard of vectors. Brother Eddie may have heard of vectors before. 
uh, in his engineering uh, career. Vector, vectors is basically an invisible line that gives direction and magnitude. To make that a little more clear, 100 mile an hour is a force. But if you just tell somebody, I'm going 100 miles an hour, that's, that means you're going fast and you've got a force behind you pushing you, but they don't know where you're going. If you just say, say hey, Taylor, I'm going 100 miles an hour, and he just says, well, that's great. You know, I might see you in a few minutes, and you may be going to the other side of the world. I don't know where you're going just because you're going 100 miles an hour. But a vector has directions and magnitude. Uh, so that would say I'm going 100 miles an hour north on 45. That would be an invisible line that I'm headed north at 100 miles an hour. And that's what, that's what planes, airplanes use. It's called vectors, and that's an aviation term. It's not enough, folks, that we're just moving, but we need to be moving in the right direction. Balanced weight is what keeps those going in the right direction at the proper speed. Uh, we can't fly like an eagle if we're hanging to one side. See, an eagle don't fly upside down. They fly right side up. They may get, the wind may turn them just a little bit this way, but they'll straighten themselves back up. They may fall a little bit this way, but they'll straighten themselves back up. And they may soar this way, but they'll, they'll straighten themselves back up. Hebrews says this, Seeing them that we are compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. So what is a weight? Anything that keeps you from soaring like you're supposed to. Anything that keeps you from soaring like an eagle like you're supposed to. Uh, I've heard people say, well, I can't, I can't lay this down. I can't lay this down. Uh, well, we can't fly right. We're, going, we're headed for a crash when we can't lay something down. We'll have to lay those things aside that's a hindrance, hindrance so we can fly. I'm not going to be able to get to but one more of these. I'm gonna, let me talk about lift. We'll just have to pick up the other two at a later date. Several things affect lift. That is air speed, wing size, angle, air, and density. An airplane has to, has to sustain hours in the air, so they have a 90 degrees center of pressure that they operate on. They got a degree mark, and they try to keep that thing at the right degree so your plane sits level. It don't flop around on you. Now, you will hear the wings bump every once in a while. They will bump a little bit. And Lacey's nervous already, just thinking about that. Uh, that. That will bump a little bit, but if you if you will sit where you can see a wing, that's an amazing little piece of equipment right there, a wing of an airplane. Because it's got little flutters and flaps on that thing. Every once in a while, you'll see one do just tilt just so little. You'll see this one up here tilt just so little. That is a very important thing. That is what is causing the lift on the airplane. Those angles of air density coming under those wings is what's causing that airplane to lift up. Uh, it's pretty amazing when you think about Christians trying to fly without things that will lift you up. We've got the Word of God for our atlas and roadmap to get to heaven. It is amazing. How many Christians try to make it without reading the Word of God? Not only reading, studying. Those things lift you up. They feel, a lot of people feel like that the Bible will condemn you. It, actually, it will help you. It will lift you up. It will give you the proper lift that you need. The Bible says the race is not to the swift, but it's the one that endures until the end. And when we don't have the proper lift, we're not, we're not going to clear some hurdles that our airplane needs to clear. You're not going to get over every power line if you don't have the proper lift. You're going to dip down to where you, where an airplane don't fly good in the treetop. He gets up above the treetop. He gets up above, up above the power line. He even gets up above the storms most of the time. If you've got the proper lift walking in your Christian life and you want to soar like a neighbor, get up above that stuff. Get on up and out of the way above that. It's 15 till. We're fixing to have the first bell. I wanted to tell you about drag. Uh, we, we ain't going to get, get to drag this morning. And force. Uh, these are a lot of good things. 
Let me just, let me tell you one. I've got time for one thing on this end. It's, I hope it makes sense since I didn't get to tell you all the rest of this stuff. December the 7th, 1941. Do you, any of y'all know what that was? That's the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The Japanese attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor. Uh, it was a surprise attack. We were not ready for it. 2,403 uh, soldiers were killed. 1,778 more wounded. They destroyed 169 naval ships and planes. For days, men and women cried and grieved under the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and all the things in the people's lives that were destroyed. What was left of Pearl Harbor was only a few pilots, maybe 100 pilots left from the Pearl Harbor days. The commander general got the orders and it said to attack Japan. Attack Japan. The problem was that our fighter planes had never made that trip to Japan and back in one trip. We had always been able to land and refuel to get back to Pearl Harbor. The order came to attack Japan, and the general knew there was no, they was not going to let us down to refuel our planes that was fixing to bomb Japan. And so he called all of his crew together, some about 100 pilots left, and he told the pilots, he said, we have our orders to attack. We've got so many fighter jets left with the, with the bombs intact that we can use. The problem is, is I don't know if we, can, if we can get back or not. He said, I know we can make the trip. I know we can get there. I know we can drop the bombs, but I don't, we've never flown this type of mission. And I don't know if our planes will have a sufficient fuel to get back. He says, so I'm going to ask you pilots for volunteers, if any of you would like to volunteer to fly a mission that's never been flown on a bomber that's never went this far on a round trip. And several soldiers backed out of the line. And the general didn't feel bad about him because he couldn't tell him for sure that it was going to make it. He said, I don't know if it's going to make it. But there was a select few that stepped up instead of stepping back and said, send us. The general said, sirs, I admire your bravery, but I know you're scared. You've got family back home. And I wished I could assure you of a safe trip, but I can't assure you that. But your bravery will forever be known. And one pilot stepped up and he said, sir, America needs a hero, and I was created to fly. America needs a hero, and I was created to fly. Let me tell you, folks, those words this morning, America needs a hero, and you were created to fly. You were created to soar like an eagle. If the world ever needs Christian people, it needs it right now. We're in a pitiful shape. We're in a terrible shape. And we need someone to soar. We need someone to lift, to have the proper thrust, the proper lift, to get up above this stuff. Uh, we, we need these. We need balanced weight in our life so we can show America what a real hero is. If you don't remember anything else I've said this morning, remember those words of that one soldier. Sir, America needs a hero, and I was created to fly. You were created to fly, folks. You were created to fly. Let's give the Lord a big hand for his word this morning. <clears throat> I thank you so much for coming. I apologize I didn't get to everything I had in my lesson. Probably 